first six months of 1943, nine new aircraft carriers joined the Pacific Fleet. By January 1944, a single unit, Task Force 58, had six fleet carriers and six light carriers. It had more aerial strength than the entire U.S. Navy possessed in 1941. The Navy's growing power would be applied to Admiral Nimitz's strategy of leapfrogging island by island towards Rabaul, the key Japanese outpost in New Britain. The way would then be clear to move on to Japan. The United States Army Air Forces adopted another approach. They created whole new air forces in each theater as required. The Bismarck Sea lies between the Admiralty Islands to the north and New Britain and New Guinea to the south. Japanese sea lanes were regularly patrolled by General George Kinney's B-17s and B-24s. Every flight was a hazard. Planes were overweight from fuel and bombs. They were taking off from short coral runways. It was dreary, dangerous work. They were flying at the limits of their range. The patrols lasted as long as 12 hours over the trackless waters. If the aircraft were damaged by the enemy, getting back to base was problematic. On December 30th, 1942, reconnaissance photos showed the heaviest concentration of shipping ever seen at Rabaul. There were 70 merchant and 21 warships. For the next 90 days, these ships became prime targets for the 5th Air Force. Attacks were mounted on Rabaul and on convoys being sent to reinforce Japanese garrisons in New Guinea. The Japanese responded with heavier fighter escorts. This was just what Kenny wanted. His goal was to destroy Japanese air power on the ground and in the air. As Japanese aerial strength declined, General Kenney's forces built up. By March 1943, he had 114 bombers and 154 fighters, including aircraft of the Royal Australian Air Force. It was a mixed bag. The most promising planes were the new B-25 C-1 Mitchells, they had been modified for strafing with eight forward-firing 50-caliber machine guns. They could sweep in low over land or water. They could sling a 500-pound bomb with a five-second delay fuse inside a thin-walled merchant ship and blow its bottom out. Dozens of Japanese garrisons were condemned to slow starvation as Japan's merchant fleet was eradicated by aerial attack, mines, and submarines. But Japan remained determined to reinforce New Guinea. In early March, the 51st Japanese Infantry Division was sent down the Bismarck Sea in a convoy of eight destroyers and seven merchant ships. The weather was bad. The Japanese hoped to make the five-day journey hidden from Kenny's forces. The American 5th Air Force had a wide variety of aircraft types, all differing in performance. But they were able to mount a coordinated action on March 2nd that sank all of the transports and four of the destroyers. General MacArthur described it as the decisive aerial engagement in the Pacific theater of the war. General George Kenney and his 5th Air Force had created an aerial blockade. It doomed Japanese troops on New Guinea to fitful resupply by submarines or small barges operating at night. 
Kenny honed his weapon in combat. He continually raised performance standards. It was like a baseball club transforming itself into a World Series winner in the course of the spring season. There was an increasingly violent argument between MacArthur and Nimitz over the main axis of attack on Japan. They also argued over who should control the majority of the forces. MacArthur and Nimitz neither liked nor respected each other. Their arguments confirmed the wisdom of the decision to limit the Pacific offensive in favor of Europe. The bickering led to a cutback on the objective to capture a ball and advance beyond the Solomon Islands in 1943. The bitter losses at Guadalcanal and in New Guinea made it obvious that island hopping tactics should be adopted. Islands harboring Japanese aviation installations or large troop concentrations would be neutralized by bombing. Then they would be bypassed and left to starve. Frontal assaults were to be avoided whenever possible. The Japanese Navy and Merchant Marine were to be systematically hunted down and destroyed. The object was to force them to abandon the Bismarck Solomon's line of resistance. To the southwest, General MacArthur used his newfound air power capability in movements up the New Guinea coastline. A landing would be made, a perimeter established, and an airfield built. C-47s would fly in the necessary fuel and supplies. Within days, P-38s and the New Republic P-47 Thunderbolts would be operating to cover the next landing. But Allied forces were still subject to threats from Japanese aircraft at Rabaul and Wewak. Kenny decided to deal with Wewak first. On August 17, 1943, B-24s and B-17s smashed airfields around Wewak with 200 tons of bombs. Two hours later, they were followed up by B-25s and P-38 Lightnings. Japanese planes on the ground were decimated. The Japanese later referred to the Black Day of August 17th. One hundred fifty aircraft and their irreplaceable air and ground crews had been destroyed. Rabaul became the graveyard of the Japanese Naval Air Force. Japanese Army pilots were drawn off from Rabaul to other battlefields. They were replaced from the rapidly diminishing pool of Japanese naval aviators. The carrier admirals protested, but their protests had no effect. In preparation for the invasion of Bougainville, General Kinney undertook to kill Rabaul with a series of air raids. On October 12, 1943, he launched the biggest raid yet seen in the Pacific Theater. 349 aircraft, Liberators, Lightnings, Mitchell attack planes, and Australian bowfighters. Fields around Rabaul were smashed with strafing and parafrag bombs. The attacks were over in minutes. They destroyed or damaged 152 Japanese aircraft, 
they also set off explosions in the fuel and ammunition dumps. The loss of fuel and ammunition was crucial. It was even harder to replace than airplanes. The vice slowly closed on Bougainville. By October 15th, Major General Nathan Twining, the new air commander in the Solomons, possessed a striking force of 223 aircraft. There were 264 fighters. Among them were the tried and true F-4Fs, Bell P-39s, and Curtis P-40s. There were also 163 of the new F-4U Corsairs, 48 Grumman Hellcats, and 22 P-38s. All of these new aircraft had superb performance. They dramatically outclassed anything the Japanese had to offer in speed, range, armor, and armament. The gull-winged Corsair was known to the Japanese as the Whispering Death. It would remain in production longer than any other U.S. fighter. From 1940 to 1952, 12 and a half thousand would be built. Its huge Pratt & Whitney R2800 radial engine generated 2100 horsepower for takeoff. The Corsair was extraordinarily rugged and versatile. It could lift huge ordnance loads and deliver them with precision. Its top speed was 446 miles an hour and its range was just over a thousand miles. For the Marines, the Corsair was a weapon that made the beloved Wildcat seem like a toy. Flying from land and sea, it achieved an 11 to 1 kill ratio against Japanese fighters. Some Japanese officers rated it the best fighter they faced. The Corsair's chief rival, the Grumman F6F Hellcat, was designed specifically to counter the Zero. It did just that. By the end of the war, the Hellcat had racked up over 5,000 victories against about 250 losses. The Hellcat was extremely maneuverable and rugged. It could take on the best Japanese aircraft and pilots in one-on-one -on -one combat. In just three years, Grumman built more than 12,600 of the F-6Fs, improving them continually. Not every new American aircraft was an immediate success. The Curtis SB-2C-1 Helldiver earned the nickname The Beast. It was difficult to handle and had many mechanical problems. For a long time, many of its crews preferred the old Douglas Dauntless. It took months in action for the Helldiver to prove itself. Even then, it never gained the degree of acceptance given so willingly to the Dauntless and the Avenger. For the crews in the Pacific, there was an increasing number of creature comforts. As soon as bases were stabilized, shipping space was found for such items as ice-making machines, fans, and washing machines. They were luxuries undreamed of in the early days of Guadalcanal. It was part of an American pattern of making life comfortable. It could never be eradicated, even under wartime conditions. Japanese soldiers, who considered themselves lucky if they had rice to cook, looked on captured American K-rations with awe. The Bougainville invasion was commanded by Admiral Halsey. It began on November 1st, 1943, and provoked a sharp reaction from the Japanese. Japan still felt strong at sea. In a replay of tactics that had worked well at Guadalcanal, the high command sent a powerful group of cruisers and destroyers to counterattack the American landings at Empress Augusta Bay. But the Japanese were beaten in a brilliant night action. Rear Admiral Merrill's outnumbered and outgunned fleet used radar ranging to sink one cruiser and a destroyer. The Japanese Admiral fled to save his ships. The Japanese then deployed six additional heavy cruisers to Rabaul 
to crush Merrill's forces. Admiral Halsey responded. He ordered his carriers and Kenny's bombers to attack the Japanese fleet in the harbor at Rabaul. Raids took place on November 5th and 11th. They destroyed the aerial opposition and mauled the enemy fleet so badly that the heavy cruisers were never again sent to sea. The Japanese were badly shaken by the loss of so many experienced air crews. They withdrew their ships and remaining aircraft 600 miles north to truck. On Bougainville, the ground battle followed the Guadalcanal scenario. 27,000 American troops formed a perimeter around the beachhead. Inside this perimeter, an airfield was soon built. Japanese forces were miles from the invasion site. They had great difficulty in coming to battle via the jungle trails. Often, they resorted to traveling down by barges at night. In the end, an uneasy stalemate grew as the Japanese remained concentrated in the area in the south around Buin. There, they spent much of their time growing food to survive. The battle continued well into 1945. Some Japanese troops, sick and malnourished, held out until the end of the war. In a six-month period, from October 1943 to March 1944, the Bismarck Archipelago had been isolated, thanks to effective cooperation of land, sea, and air forces. The Japanese Air Force at Rabaul had been destroyed. By January 1944, the fast carrier force of the Pacific Fleet had reached an undreamed-of level of strength. There were four Essex-class carriers, six light carriers, and the old tried-and-true Enterprise and Saratoga. There were enough other ships to provide an effective anti-aircraft screen or to take on the Japanese combined fleet if necessary. As his strength built, Rear Admiral Mark Mitcher became confident enough to go in harm's way, confronting Japanese island-based aircraft. In the early months of 1944, the Americans struck Kwajalein, the world's largest coral atoll, with one of the most complicated amphibious operations in history. Once again, there was no Japanese aerial resistance. The incredibly swift manner in which the Americans gobbled up the Gilbert and Marshall Islands unnerved the Japanese. They were left without time to prepare their next line of defense in the Marianas adequately. The defense of the islands came to be regarded in Japan as buying time to delay the invasion of the Japanese mainland. In effect, the Japanese high command had exchanged one illusion for another. At the beginning of the war, the Japanese had hoped that a series of stinging defeats would bring the Allies to the negotiating table. Now they hoped to secure a negotiated peace by making the prospect of an invasion too costly for the Allies, given that everyone man, woman, and child would resist, even if they only had bamboo sticks as weapons. In New Guinea in March 1944, the Fifth Air Force cleared the way for General MacArthur to leapfrog along the northwest coast. Between March 11th and 16th, General Kenney's bombers dropped 1,600 tons of bombs and fired a million rounds of ammunition. The bulk of the Japanese Air Force was left as derelict wrecks. But by late March, the Japanese had scraped together 351 aircraft. They stationed them at three air bases near the port of Hollandia, 
The Americans knew that the Japanese anti-aircraft defenses were heavy. A new strategy was followed. On March 30th, Liberators, escorted by P-38s, plastered the airfield with 120-pound frag cluster bombs and 20-pound fragmentation bombs. Anti-aircraft fire was lighter than expected. No determined attacks came from the Japanese fighters. The attack was repeated the following day with similar results. 209 aircraft were destroyed. The Japanese flew many of their remaining aircraft out of the area, once again conceding air superiority. A three-wave Allied attack on April 3rd destroyed Hollandia as an airbase. Japanese air opposition in New Guinea was now negligible. Japanese ground resistance on New Guinea continued, but at last MacArthur was poised for a return to the Philippines. But first, there were the vital Marianas Islands. The United States now lived by the rule, no inadequate measures. The armada dispatched against the Marianas Islands was immense. The 5th Fleet had seven battleships, 21 cruisers, and 69 destroyers. Admiral Mitcher's four carrier groups had 15 aircraft carriers and almost 1,000 aircraft. The islands of the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian controlled the sea lanes of the Central Pacific. American success in the Marianas would sever Japan's jugular vein. Also, the Boeing B-29 bomber would have bases within range of the Japanese mainland. Command of the Japanese fleet was given to Vice Admiral Ozawa Jisaburo. Only six months earlier, his force would have been overpowering. His battleships included the two largest and most powerful ever built. But they were one war out of date. After so many defeats, Japan was thirsting for a victory. Ozawa had 100 aircraft based in the Marianas. The Japanese aircraft had a range advantage over the Americans. Ozawa hoped to catch the Americans napping, giving them a one-two punch with his land-based and carrier-based aircraft. But misfortune stalked the Japanese. Half their plan was destroyed by Admiral Mitcher's Task Force 58. Task Force 58 included 470 Grumman Hellcats, 199 Grumman Avengers, as well as Douglas SPDs, Curtis Helldivers, and even three Vought F4U2 Night Fighters. At 1300 hours on June 11th, Mitcher sent 211 Grumman Hellcats to hit airfields at Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. 81 Japanese aircraft were shot down. Another 29 were destroyed on the ground. But this carnage was only a prelude to what would become known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot a few days later. On June 15th, Four carriers under Rear Admiral J.J. Jocko Clark struck Iwo Jima and Chichijima. They were the Japanese mustering points for staging to the Marianas. Clark launched his Hellcats, Avengers, and Helldivers from 135 miles south of Iwo Jima. Thirty-eight Zeros intercepted the Americans. Twenty-eight of them were shot down. The Americans then proceeded to strafe the airfields, fuel dumps, and small vessels. On June 15th, Saipan was invaded. Before the day was out, 20,000 Marines were on shore, complete with their artillery. Admiral Spruance issued orders for the complete destruction of Ozawa's fleet. He told Admiral Mitcher that the carriers should be knocked out first. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, the Japanese launched their own attack. The American Hellcats fell on the aging Zeros and shot them out of the sky. Only a few Japanese aircraft broke through to the fleet. Withering anti-aircraft fire claimed 17 more victims. Only one bomb hit was scored on the battleship South Dakota. Of the 65 attackers, between 40 and 60 were destroyed. It was the greatest single day's victory in the Pacific War, and more was to come. Late the following afternoon, American aircraft finally located the Japanese fleet. Spruance ordered an attack. The light carrier Hiryu was sunk. The Zuikaku, veteran of so many battles, took a direct hit but survived. Two light carriers, the Junyo and the Chiyoda, were damaged by bombs. The Japanese lost at least 65 Zeros, as well as other aircraft. Ozawa's force was now a hollow shell. 400 planes had been shot down or lost on the three sunken carriers. An entire second generation of naval aviators was killed. The battle for Saipan ended on July 9th. Admiral Nagumo, who had begun his nation's war so brilliantly at Pearl Harbor, was the island's commanding general. He committed suicide. Guam and Tinian were liberated by August 12, 1944. It had been a long and bloody campaign. More than 600 Japanese aircraft were destroyed at the cost of 65 U.S. Navy planes. The almost 10 to 1 victory ratio showed how markedly superior U.S. aircraft, pilots, and tactics had become. Work began immediately on Saipan to create runways for the Boeing B-29s. At last, the home islands of Japan would be within range of bombing raids from bases in the Pacific. Japan strained every fiber to resist the American advance. Increasingly, it found itself relying on the spirit of gyokusai, meaning the crushing of jewels which implied that the proud Japanese people would prefer death to defeat or surrender. The idea of gyokusai combined with the irresistible force of the American onslaught to create a climate in which the extreme measure of suicide attack became logical. It was already apparent to any Japanese pilot that he could not live through combat. It was only a small step to decide that a suicide flight that could take out a valuable ship could be far more useful to Japan. Tokotai was portrayed to the Japanese people as a totally voluntary effort by patriots who became war guards. But the program became increasingly a psychological confidence trick. Many of the early kamikaze pilots felt that they were following the proud Bushido warrior tradition. Many others were tricked into volunteering and then kept in the cause by a combination of social pressure and military orders. In defending the Philippines against the return of General MacArthur, the Japanese staked everything on the likelihood of a climactic sea battle. The Japanese plan was called Victory One. An American carrier attack began on October 12, 1944. In three days, four carrier groups flew 2,498 sorties. Admiral Fukudome Shigeru reported that more than 500 of his planes had been shot down like so many eggs thrown against the stone wall of indomitable enemy formations. 
General MacArthur's promise to return to the Philippines began to be fulfilled on October 17, 1944. American troops began to land on A-Day, October 20th. They met little opposition as they moved inland and began improving airfields at Dulag and Tacloban. In the meantime, the Japanese Operation Victory One lumbered along. Its 64 ships were about to be pitted against 216 American and two Australian Navy ships. On October 24th, a Japanese Judy dive bomber slipped through the American Hellcats and put two bombs into the light carrier Princeton's torpedo storage area. The explosion sank the Princeton and damaged the cruiser Birmingham. The Americans responded with a furious attack by 259 aircraft. They scored 19 torpedo and 17 bomb hits on the super battleship Musashi. On the night of October 24th, American PT boats and destroyers demolished the van of the Japanese Southern Force. The next day, Admiral Kurita's fleet of four battleships, six heavy cruisers, and 11 destroyers burst upon the American transports in almost perfect execution of his part of the Victory One plan. Kurita assumed he had surprised Mitcher's Task Force 38, but in fact, only three destroyers, four destroyer escorts, and six small escort carriers stood between the Japanese and the Allied invasion force. Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague ordered his forces to attack. His tiny, tinny destroyers and destroyer escorts raced in to savage the Japanese with torpedoes and small gunfire. The carriers launched their torpedo-armed Grumman Avengers. Two other groups of escort carriers also launched their aircraft. Karita had to contend with 253 fighters and 143 torpedo planes. The American crews flew sortie after sortie. They sank three Japanese heavy cruisers with torpedoes. Suddenly, incredibly, Kurita ordered his center force to retire. It was a monumental American victory, the stuff of the old John Wayne movies. But it was a victory won at great cost, and there was more to come in the form of the first attacks by the Kamikaze Corps. On October 25th, Lieutenant Seiki led four Zeros laden with 251 kilogram bombs through the American escort carrier's defensive screen. A second wave of five Zeros broke through the Wildcat fighters. One of them sent its bomb crashing through the flight deck of the St. Lo. It set off fires and explosions that ultimately sank the ship. Not one of the six carriers went unscathed. It was an inauspicious beginning for a drama that would rise to greater heights before the battle for the Philippines was over and culminate in the battles to come off Okinawa. Admiral Halsey began the Battle of Cape Engano on October 25th. Hell divers, Hellcats, and Avengers savaged the Japanese. In three waves of attack, the Japanese lost four carriers. Ozawa made his getaway with absolutely nothing to show for the battle. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was finished. So, for all practical purposes, was the Japanese Navy. But the U.S. had been presented with a new and apparently unsolvable problem, the kamikaze attack. The Japanese, heartened by their kamikaze successes, would harass the American fleet. They would carefully husband their kamikaze assets. They would try to concentrate on important targets, Aircraft carriers were first priority, then battleships or cruisers when possible. 
the Americans developed new defensive tactics. Destroyers were placed as picket ships as far as 60 miles away from the carriers to provide early warning. Combat air patrols were divided into three altitudes. High cap flew up to 25,000 feet. Med cap flew at 10,000 and jack cap as low as 3,000. Far-ranging fighter sweeps, nicknamed the Big Blue Blanket, were sent deep into the Philippines to catch the kamikazes forming up. The attacks could not be stopped, but an inherent weakness emerged. Even when they struck a ship squarely, the aircraft often did little damage. It was a hard physical fact that most of the planes, even at the end of their plunge, didn't have the mass required to cause fatal damage. They were unable to reach the terminal velocity of a bomb delivered by a dive bomber. Attacks caused fire, explosions, and casualties on ships. But the increasingly expert Navy damage control teams were able to save most of the ships themselves. General MacArthur had returned to the Philippines to fight the Japanese. They had 350,000 troops spread out over the islands. The Japanese General Yamashita was unable to resist the onslaught of American air and ground forces. Japanese land-based air power was wiped out early on. By the fall of 1944, the Pacific Theater was receiving enough men and materiel to wage war on an unprecedented scale. The island-hopping strategy was working perfectly. On October 3, 1944, the Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered the B-29 bombings to be stepped up. The bases for the B-29s were to be Saipan and two others yet to be acquired from strong Japanese defending forces, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Iwo Jima was located in the Bonin Islands. It was only four and a half miles long and two and a half miles wide but it was vital as an intermediate base for B-29s and for the new long-range P-51 escort fighters. The invasion was planned for February 19, 1945. Carrier planes from Task Force 38 struck mainland Japan, reducing any air support the Japanese may have been able to provide. Iwo Jima's defenses were virtually impervious to bombing and heavy naval gunfire. Marine soldiers had to contest each pillbox and each cave until the final surrender on March 24th. Okinawa was 57 miles long and 12 miles wide. It was located strategically only 350 miles from the Japanese mainland. It was also directly on communication lines to Formosa and mainland China. On Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1945, 60,000 men of the invasion force landed with training film precision. The United States wanted Okinawa as a springboard for the invasion of Japan. But this island was just as prepared for a long defense as Iwo Jima. Its 100,000-man garrison would fight the most costly ground battle in the Pacific theater. The Japanese allowed the invaders to overrun three quarters of the island. They retreated to the south. The retreat reduced Japanese exposure to naval bombardment. It also pinned down the huge American fleet of combat vessels auxiliaries, and transports for air attack. American Carrier Task Force 58 was positioned to the north and carried out strikes against airfields on Kyushu. Task Force 57 of the Royal Navy's Pacific Fleet 
operated to the south, warding off attacks from Formosa. The British carrier's steel decks proved invulnerable to kamikazes. The Japanese air campaign to defend Okinawa was called Kikusai, or floating chrysanthemum. Its first attack took place on April 6th. The Allies were ready. 250 enemy aircraft were shot down even before they reached the radar picket screen. The attackers lost another 55 inbound to Okinawa and 171 while making the attack. In just a few minutes, 476 chrysanthemums floated no more. But 180 of the suicide planes got through. They sank a destroyer, two merchant ships, and an LST landing ship tank. 466 Americans were killed. Morale was sharply shaken by the way the Japanese planes continued to bore in, even after they were hit and burning. On the afternoon of April 8th, Kikusai-2 was launched. Most of the Japanese pilots attacked the radar picket stations to the north. They sank a destroyer. But the intensity of the kamikaze attacks dwindled as the Japanese ran out of planes and pilots. In 10 Kikusai assaults, there were almost 2,000 kamikaze attacks. There were also 6,300 sorties by fighters and bombers of the Army and Navy Air Forces. The kamikaze attack was terrifying. It seemed to each sailor on each ship the suicide plane was heading directly at him. The attackers sank 21 ships. They damaged 43 others so badly that they had to be scrapped. They put another 223 out of action for more than a month. The U.S. Navy's personnel losses were greater than it had incurred in all wars before World War II. 4,907 officers and men killed, 4,824 wounded. Most of these were due to the kamikaze attacks. On land, the fighting was the most intense so far experienced in the Pacific War. After 11 weeks of bitter fighting, the islands were secured. 135,000 Japanese soldiers had been killed. The ruthless conduct of the Japanese overlords caused 75,000 Okinawan civilian deaths. 7,374 American soldiers were killed. Both sides lost their commanders. Official U.S. government pronouncements minimize the effect of the kamikaze attacks. In later years, this would have been called a cover-up. The truth was that the kamikaze attacks hurt the Navy. If Japan had been able to sustain them, casualty figures for the war would have been vastly increased. Japanese resistance and the grievous American losses on Okinawa showed just how high a price would have to be paid 
for an invasion of the home islands of Japan. Their ranges would be shorter, and the number of airfields from which attacks could be made would be greater. Millions of casualties would be unavoidable. With the fall of Okinawa and the occupation of the Philippines, the strategic hopes of Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur were now fulfilled. prepared for a final aerial assault on Japan. Now, the hard task of invasion would at last be possible. The great American advance through the South Pacific has overshadowed long and hard-fought battles in other parts of Asia. Flying the hump between India and China was dangerous business. Flying conditions were abominable. Aircraft heavily laden with supplies for embattled China would take off in the dense, moist heat of India's Brahmaputra Valley. It would climb to meet turbulence and icing over the mountain ranges. The route between Dinjan and in India and Kunming and China was called the Aluminum Trail because it was littered with the wreckage of 450 aircraft. The hump operation carried 650,000 tons of material to China. It enabled the building of airfields for B-29s to attack Japan. It provided the means for attacking Japanese shipping in the seas around China and Indochina. And under the same conditions, the 10th and 14th Air Forces supported the Pacific War effort and contributed greatly to the Allies' relentless march toward the home islands of Japan. 